I, 30-year-old man, am still fighting over this conflict with my ex-girlfriend, who I'll call Jane, 27-year-old woman, who ended up cheating on me after dating for five years. Jane and I were childhood friends for as long as I can remember. I never thought in a million years that she would do this to me, or be this type of person who would cheat. I thought we had a great relationship with our normal ups and downs like any other couple. About a year ago, I was contacted by some girl I didn't know through social media. I don't usually respond to messages sent by people I don't know, but this girl who I'll call Sam sent me a message saying that Jane was cheating on me. Somehow she knew about Jane. I told her to please provide any proof she had. She ended up sending me screenshots of text messages between her friend, who I'll call Kevin, 28-year-old man, and Jane. They were sending explicit messages and talking about intimacy things that I can't describe here. The thing that shocked me the most was the text Jane had sent about her being pregnant. We were talking about having a baby at the time, before I discovered the cheating. And we did initiate intimacy with protection, of course. I was furious, to say the least. Sam had sent me a video of Kevin drunkenly admitting to sleeping with Jane without protection. Sam told me she had gotten a hold of Kevin's phone while he was out, and it was left unlocked. She wanted to let me know about this issue because she didn't want me to have false hopes of being the father to a child that might not be mine. I thanked her and asked how she found me. She said she had found Jane's social media account, which was linked back to me in a post. Jane's social media is open, but she doesn't really use it much, other than making posts about us or shopping for accessories. I thanked Sam for letting me know and saved all the screenshots she sent me, along with the video. Jane was visiting her mother at the time, so I took the liberty of packing Jane's belongings and other important things she owns. Jane came home later that day, looking happy and excited. I had to put on a fake smile when she delivered the news that she was pregnant and hugged me. I told her we should go out to celebrate, and she agreed, not knowing what I had in store for her. I ended up driving her back to her mother's place as she was confused as to why we were there. I told her that she could drop the act and that I knew about the cheating. She looked shocked and started denying it until I showed her all the screenshots I got from Sam. Jane ended up breaking down and confessing that the cheating was true. I asked how long it had been going on and Jane, in a hysterical state, told me that she had been seeing Kevin behind my back for the last two years. Then I asked if they had used protection when she was cheating on me with Kevin. And she said no. I told Jane we were done and that she should never contact me again. She lost it and started crying even harder after I took out her belongings from the trunk of my car. She refused to get out of the vehicle and begged for another chance. She even told me that she would have the A word if it meant that I would stay with her. I was spooked by hearing that. I didn't expect her to stoop so low. I told her that whatever she decided wouldn't undo the damage she had done to both of us. I ended up getting Jane's mother involved and explained the situation to her, showing her the evidence and conversation I had secretly recorded. Jane's mother apologized for her daughter's actions, and after a couple of minutes, Jane finally got out of my vehicle. I drove off without looking back or giving her a chance to speak to me again. I ended up breaking down myself after I got back home. I couldn't eat or sleep right after what happened. And this was a repeated cycle that lasted for a couple of months. It's been almost a year now, and I've nearly recovered from the incident, but the scars are still there. Just two weeks ago, Jane messaged me since the breakup and told me she wanted to get back together. I told her no straight up and blocked her. Then, a few days ago, Jane showed up at my front door. She looked like a total mess when I saw her through the doorbell camera, and she was asking me to speak to her. I didn't let her in, so I asked her what the hell she wanted. Jane said that Kevin ended up ghosting her soon after she gave birth to the baby, and they don't know where Kevin is. I told her that it was her problem to deal with and reminded her that Kevin was the guy she left me for. She begged me to help her because she hadn't gotten any sleep, and she's basically on her own. Her parents ended up kicking her out of their house after she gave birth. Jane said that cheating on me was her biggest mistake and that she doesn't like being a single mom and taking care of a kid on her own. She asked me if I'm willing to take care of her kid as if it was my own. I got angry and told her to F off and that as far as her and I are concerned, there's no her and I anymore. I said that her kid she made while cheating on me was not my problem. I told her that every ounce of love and respect I had for her died the moment I found out about the cheating. 
Jane left soon after crying. Her friends are now blasting me on social media for not stepping up and telling me that I'm not a real man after all that Jane has done for me and that I owe it to her. They also said that even though she made a mistake, she was there for me. So it would be horrible of me to not be there for her and the kid. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment one, this feels fake. Everything feels too overdramatic. And the fact you didn't even bother checking the possibility of the child being yours is the most damning. Condoms aren't 100% contraceptive. The birth could still have been from you. If the story is true, she doesn't deserve your love. But if it was me, the slightest chance that the kid could actually be mine would drive me crazy until I find out. You could also shut her up that way or dig yourself deeper if you don't want to pay childcare. Comment two, block them all and move on. Do not respond. Remember, Jane didn't make a mistake. She made several mistakes over two years and likely would have led you to believe the child was yours. Now for the update. Thanks for sticking around for this update. So, after Jane's friends started blasting me on social, things got even messier. One of her friends, who I'll just call Friend A, decided to take it a step further and started spreading rumors at my workplace. I work at a local tech company, and reputation is everything. Friend A somehow knows a coworker of mine and fed them a sob story about how I abandoned Jane and the baby. Next thing I know, I'm getting side eyes at the office, and my boss is asking me for a quick chat. In that meeting, my boss, who's usually a chill guy, was all serious and asking if everything was okay at home. I had to explain the whole cheating saga to him, which was humiliating. He understood, but the damage to my rep was done. Coworkers I used to joke around with were now treating me like I was some heartless ex. But wait, it gets worse. Jane's mom, who had been on my side, suddenly flipped the script. She called me crying, saying that I should forgive Jane and help her with the baby. She said Jane was struggling and that the baby shouldn't suffer because of our issues. I felt for the kid, I really did. But I couldn't just forget everything and play happy families. Then, out of nowhere, Kevin reappears. He shows up at my place, unannounced, looking like he's been through a war. He tells me he's sorry for everything and that he wants to make things right. He says he's been in rehab for the past few months, dealing with some serious addiction issues. And that's why he ghosted Jane. He's clean now, or so he claims, and he wants to be a part of the baby's life. I didn't know what to make of it. Part of me wanted to slam the door in his face, but another part of me thought about the baby, not having a dad around, that's tough. So I told Kevin that it wasn't my place to forgive him, but if he was serious about being a dad, he needed to prove it to Jane and the baby, not me. Kevin left and I thought that was the end of it, but no, Jane shows up again, this time with the baby. She's heard that Kevin came to see me and wants to know what we talked about. I told her it's none of her business and that she should be talking to Kevin, not me. She breaks down right there on my doorstep saying she can't do this alone and she's scared Kevin will bail again. I felt a twinge of something, pity maybe, but I held my ground. I told her that she made her choice and now she has to live with it. I can't be her safety net. She left, baby in her arms, and I watched her go, feeling a mix of relief and something else I couldn't quite place. The aftermath was a quiet kind of chaos. Jane's friends finally backed off after I threatened legal action for defamation. Work is slowly getting back to normal, though I can tell some people still believe the rumors. As for Jane, I heard through the grapevine that she and Kevin are trying to work things out for the baby's sake. I don't know if it'll last, but that's their circus, not mine. Thanks for reading this mess of an update. Am I the idiot for dumping my partner after a disappointing proposal and a series of betrayals? My nonchalant live-in partner proposed to me during our vacation abroad. You might think I said yes, but I didn't. It was the most unplanned and lackluster proposal I've ever witnessed. I didn't ask for much, but this fell far short of my modest expectations. He said he wanted the proposal to be just the two of us, to prove he could do it alone without anyone's help. Most of our arguments stem from his dependence on me or others, showing he couldn't stand on his own. And guess what? I was right. Here's how it went down. We had spent the entire day on an adventure, and by evening we were exhausted, feet sore, and looking for a place to dine with our friends. It was raining slightly, and I was chatting away as usual when he suddenly showed me a ring box. I was shocked, thinking, seriously? You're doing it now, in this awful moment? I laughed, 
But inside, I was disappointed. He didn't ask me. He didn't kneel. I know he was nervous, but he knew I was let down. I had no idea he would propose on this trip, and honestly, I wished he hadn't. Our friends were surprised too and wanted to take a photo, but I declined. I wore the ring for a while, even though it was loose, then eventually told him to put it back in the box because I might lose it. There were so many better moments on this trip when he could have proposed, but he didn't because he was only thinking of himself. If he wanted it private, he could have done it at home or in our hotel room, not in the worst moment and place. We barely talked about it afterward. That night in our room, there was a heavy silence. I woke up around midnight and sent him a message expressing my disappointment and telling him to ask me again when he was truly ready. But as a negative person, he took it badly. On our last day, he gave off such negative vibes, barely speaking and avoiding photos, knowing how much I love capturing memories. He ruined the day and I ended up returning to our hotel early. You might think, oh, you could have just said yes. It's the thought that counts. But no, throughout our relationship, I've been the one doing everything. My goals and plans were always for us, while he had none. I was doing all the work, and he just followed my lead. I even make more money than him. Sometimes I'd tell him I wanted to quit working someday, hoping for some reassurance that he'd work hard for us, for our future. But I never got it. So no, it wasn't just about the proposal. It was about the deeper issues in our relationship that this moment highlighted. I would let it pass if he did the proposal the right way and pre-planned everything. At least he would prove to me that there was something he could do right for me that would make me feel special. Is it legit to leave him for good? I don't know. I felt like he has taken me for granted for a very long time and settled for less than what I deserve. And as time goes by, he is just proving it. Help, I'm so messed up. I have given him so much already of me. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one. Wait, you're saying that if he had prepared a better proposal centered around you, you would have accepted? All the things that you don't like about him are evident in the proposal. Two options. Talk to him directly about how you feel. Ask him about your future plans or simply walk away. If you feel that the relationship is so one-sided, why have you stayed? Comment two. If you were enthusiastic about marrying this guy, it wouldn't make sense to reject him because he didn't propose in the way you had imagined. You do not sound enthusiastic about marrying this guy. I think when you believe you want to marry someone and then he proposes to you and your immediate feeling is, no thanks, you've reached the end of the relationship. Now for the update. Hey, thanks for sticking around. A lot has happened since my last post. So after the botched proposal, things went from bad to worse. My partner, let's call him Mr. Lackluster, decided to throw a surprise party to make up for it. He invited all our friends and family thinking it would fix everything. But the party was just another disaster waiting to happen. First off, he forgot my best friend is allergic to peanuts and had a table full of peanut-based snacks. Then he played music I can't stand, all while acting like he was the perfect boyfriend. It was clear he didn't know me at all. Our friends could see right through it and the whispers started. I was embarrassed to say the least, but here's the kicker. During the party, I caught him in the kitchen, cozying up to my cousin. They were laughing a little too close for comfort. When I confronted him, he brushed it off, saying, I was overreacting. But my cousin later confessed that he'd been sending her flirty texts for weeks. I was livid. All the trust I had in him shattered in an instant. I decided to confront him after everyone left. I wanted answers. Why would he do this to me, to us? He couldn't even look me in the eye. He mumbled some excuse about feeling neglected and needing attention. That's when I knew I was done. I couldn't be with someone who sought attention from others instead of working on our issues together. The next day, I packed my bags. He begged me to stay, promising to change, but I'd heard it all before. I left him standing there alone with a look of realization that he'd lost the best thing that ever happened to him. I moved in with a friend temporarily. It was tough, but I needed space to think. I blocked Mr. Lackluster's number, but he started emailing me, sending letters, even showing up at my workplace. It was harassment, plain and simple. I had to threaten legal action to get him to stop. Then, out of the blue, I got a promotion at work. It was the break I needed. With the extra money, I found a new place, a fresh start. 
I was finally free from Mr. Lackluster's drama. But he wasn't done yet. He spread rumors about me, trying to tarnish my reputation. He told our friends I cheated on him, that I was the one sending flirty texts. It was a low blow, but I had the truth on my side. I showed our friends the texts he sent to my cousin. They were shocked and sided with me. His lies backfired and he lost many friends. I thought that was the end of it, but Mr. Lackluster had one more card to play. He claimed he was in therapy, working on himself, and wanted to meet for closure. I agreed against my better judgment. We met at a cafe, and he was all apologies, saying he realized how much he'd hurt me. But as we talked, I saw through his act. He was the same selfish person, just with a new script. I told him I forgave him, not for his sake, but for mine. I needed to move on. As I walked away, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I had stood up for myself, and it felt good. I was finally in control of my life again. Thanks for reading. Am I the idiot for talking to my wife's mom behind her back when her dad is dying? Hello, everyone. I have come here for advice before, and you were all incredibly helpful, and I could really use some support again. Jenna and I had our first daughter in February. She is amazing, and we are doing great. We ended up moving away from Jenna's home state, New York, to mine, Massachusetts, to be closer to my family, and they have been incredibly helpful with the baby. We have not seen Jenna's family since cutting contact and blocking them everywhere, and we did not tell them about the baby. Yesterday, we received a letter in the mail from my mother-in-law and father-in-law. I have no idea how they got our address. Apparently, my father-in-law has been diagnosed with late-stage cancer and is being told he could be dead in weeks. My in-laws went on about how sorry they were for the way they handled the situation with Mary. They also apologize for the way they've treated my wife her whole life. Again, check post history. But basically, Mary was the golden child and Jenna was an afterthought, despite being super accomplished. They ended by saying they recently heard about the baby through the grapevine and want to meet their grandchild. To me, the apology seemed genuine. They went into detail on what they did wrong, apologized and expressed remorse, and explained what they should have done differently. They said they hoped to earn our forgiveness with time and were willing to do family therapy to heal our relationship. Jenna is not having it. She feels like it's too little too late and does not want to respond. She also suspects that they are lying about FIL's cancer and just want to pressure us into reconciliation so they can meet the baby. It seems ludicrous, but I guess I would not put it past them. I want to respect my wife's feelings around this, but I am worried that if the cancer is real, she may regret not taking this opportunity for reconciliation before he dies. I expressed this to her, but she is adamant and I have not broached the topic since. My instinct is to wait a few more days until the shock wears off to talk about it again. I just do not know what the best way to approach it would be. I certainly do not want to force my wife to do anything she does not want to do, but I feel like she is not thinking clearly about this right now. It also must be noted that our baby is still struggling with sleep, and we are both tired and emotional all the time. So I feel like this might be influencing how she feels about all this. What should I do here? Should I try again or just let it be? TL.ER In-laws are attempting to reconcile after claiming father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Wife does not want to consider it, but I am worried she will regret it later on. Edit. People. Stop being mean to me. I too am tired and emotional and my feelings are getting hurt. I'm not forcing my wife to do anything. I brought it up one time. I know this is not about me. I do not personally care either way. I just want to support my wife. I intend to tell her I am here to listen and talk about it if she wants to, but I fully support her decisions around this. She has a great therapist she trusts, and I will be here to support her however I can. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, the timing is a little too convenient. You just had a baby and suddenly father-in-law has cancer and they want to apologize for everything they've done wrong. I would agree with your wife that it is likely nonsense. If it isn't though, and they are genuinely sorry, who cares? Them showing remorse doesn't change all the things they have done to your wife over the years. Even if she can accept their apology, it doesn't mean they automatically get to be in her life again. This isn't your decision to make, and it seems like your wife has made her decision on it. I'd drop it. Comment 2. I would ask yourself, 
If it wasn't for the child, would they have gotten in touch? Your wife is the one that needs time and space to think about it. Yours is to support anything she decides. She has the information she needs. Now she needs 100% support from you, that is all. I will say that children do not need to visit anyone. They won't remember it, nor benefit from it. It is for the parents and grandparents. So do not get guilted that the child needs to see grandparents. Now for the update. Thanks for sticking with me through this. So, after that letter from Jenna's parents, things took a turn. My sister, who's always been the reliable one, came over to help with the baby. While Jenna was resting, my sister pulled me aside and dropped a shocker. She had been in touch with Jenna's family all along, said she felt bad for them, thought they deserved a chance to know their grandchild. I couldn't believe it. My own sister, the one person I thought had our backs, had been feeding information to the very people we were trying to keep at bay. I was livid, felt betrayed. Jenna was heartbroken when I told her. She couldn't look at my sister the same way again. The woman who had been her confidant, her support through the sleepless nights had gone behind our backs. It was a mess. Jenna asked her to leave, and just like that, the family support we had crumbled. But that wasn't the end of it. The next day, Jenna's phone rang. It was Mary, her sister. She was crying, saying their dad really was sick, that it wasn't a lie, Jenna was torn. Part of her wanted to believe it, but the wound was too fresh, the trust too broken. She hung up without saying a word. I tried to be there for Jenna, but I was struggling too. The whole situation was eating at me. I wanted to fix things, but I didn't know how. Then, in a moment of weakness, I made a call to Jenna's mom. I thought maybe I could bridge the gap, mend fences, but Jenna caught me on the phone, heard me say we'd think about letting them meet the baby. She was furious, said I had no right to make that decision without her. I tried to explain, but she wouldn't listen. She said I was just like the rest of them, trying to control her life. The house was cold after that. Jenna wouldn't talk to me, and I felt like I was walking on thin ice. I slept on the couch, listened to the baby's cries through the baby monitor, and wondered how everything had gone so wrong. Then, another twist. My brother-in-law, Jenna's brother-in-law, showed up at our door. He had proof, documents from the hospital. Their dad was sick. It was all true. Jenna broke down. She didn't know what to feel anymore. Anger, guilt, sadness, it was all there. She decided to go see her dad, alone, said she needed to do this by herself. I stayed home, took care of our daughter, and waited. When Jenna came back, she was different said that seeing her dad, frail and weak, had changed something in her. She didn't forgive them, not completely, but she felt lighter, like a weight had been lifted. We're still picking up the pieces. Jenna's relationship with her family is fragile, but they're talking. My sister is trying to make amends, but it's going to take time. As for me, I'm just trying to support Jenna, be the husband she needs. I messed up, but I'm learning. It's not easy, but we're getting through it, one day at a time. Thanks for reading. If you like this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.